and welcome to Live Time. I'm Patricia Mitchell. We're going to be taking your calls about the future of food. So to make your point, call us now. I mean, there's more sort of fears, potentially, as I understand it, around things like listeria and all sorts of... Uh, and all sorts of different sort of food problems and, and health problems in the way that food is prepared. Is there anything that how you sit in, in the future that that's going to be countered, Brian, or do you actually think it's going to get worse? The only way in which you're going to counter it, and, and I hate saying this because it sounds as though I'm a doom and gloom merchant, but I'm not. I mean, I like cooking food. I love eating out in restaurants. I revel in traveling the world with eating things I've never eaten before, and I love coming home with some of those ideas and creating food in the house. Oh, you've chosen uh, them right it, now it, then, because you, it, you can it, try it, some of Claire's it, food later. I, I, she seems to be doing all right so far, <laughs> I may say. Um, but, but, but the business of disease does certainly worry me, and I'll tell you why. The whole of human history, if you look back over the last two million years, we've been conquering diseases. If you, if you sort of popped up every century throughout human history, there are always slightly fewer diseases than there were before. Things like diphtheria and plague and so forth. They belong in the distant smallpox is completely exterminated. But not in the question of foodborne diseases. Campylobacter, we now know, is a widespread organism. It's widely found on, on uncooked chicken. Campylobacter was only named in, I think, 1984. No one knew it was there before. Listeria has occurred in lots and lots of um, uh, unpasteurized cheeses and in uh, pâtés and things like that. E. coli, E. coli 0157, was born in, I think, 1982. Uh, e. coli, we all have E. coli in our guts. It's a normal, healthy part of our bodies. But one of these E. coli bacteria in North America picked up a couple of genes, actually its own genetically modification, as it were, picked up a couple of genes from an organism called Shigella, which is a very... Are you getting complicated, right, organism. though? If so, you could so just you, tell us in brief what this means what, before what, I... No, no, what it means is that this, this previously harmless organism, E. coli, has now got genes in it which will make it produce a deadly toxin. So now, are we not then creating problems potentially yes, with genetically modified food? No, not, not as yet. The reason that I'm so glad people have jumped on genetically modified food is because if the producers had got away with sneaking in GM food, and the stuff at the moment is entirely harmless as far as we can possibly reasonably tell, but if they got away with that, they'd have been dropping up other things and taking bigger risks if no one was done. Yeah, I was working on an organic farm a couple of weeks ago, and there the food was amazing. It was tasty. It was very good. It really was very good. But are there all sorts of considerations that you think, going back to you, Brian, finally, for your last words, that you think that, we, that manufacturers, manufacturers of food are going to have to take into consideration? Well, there are these new diseases, and whoever is producing and selling food has got to take note of those, and so have we as members of the public. It's certainly true that now that you need two breadwinners in every household in order to pay the mortgage and, and the school fees, obviously what has to happen is that people have less time to relax and enjoy the experience of cooking with their families. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if in 50 years' time you don't have kitchens built in homes as a matter of routine, just as we often in modern Well, that would suit me down to the ground. I <laughs> <laughs> don't think it would suit people like Paul and Danny, but it would certainly suit me. So you don't see these, these changes being too far off? Uh, no, I don't. I think within the next 20 years, the way in which food is structured the way in which we eat will have changed so much that when people look back to now, they'll think, I don't think they used to eat like that. Judy, what comment would you like to make or question would you like to ask? Um, well, I'd just like to say that, you know, um, what sort of um, threat to the environment does it have with the GM food? Judy's dead right to be worried. Uh, the way that they've been conducting trials in open fields, and of course they have been conducting them to find out what happens. Well, now we're beginning to find out what happens. Pollen can actually spread four kilometres, not 50 metres, from a genetically modified field. And we do need to understand that we're putting genes out into the environment and you cannot, as some scientists imagine, you cannot just pop out and get them back in again. Yes, Judy, that's an extremely good point and uh, I think that that concern is a very real one. What are the ramifications of that if a pollen is spreading not just 40 metres but actually spreading potentially four, kilom four kilometres? Well, people talk about super weeds. As you know, these genetically modified crops are resistant to a herbicide that you then use to kill off all the weeds. But of course, not every weed dies. 5% of them survive. The pollen spreads, and I've got no doubt that within a decade, lots of weeds are going to have this resistance gene within their own cells. And as a result, the weed killer that Monsanto is now selling won't be of use anymore. It won't make the wild plants any more vicious or virulent, but it will mean that we can't kill weeds with it. So Monsanto, within a decade, will do themselves out of business. Do you think, as you mentioned when we were first speaking, Brian, that um, uh, basically consumers are taking the lead. Paul mentioned it too. Do you think ultimately that's how we're going to sort of protect ourselves from any of the, of the more negative changes to food and food production in the next 50 years? Yes, it is. I mean, the Americans, bless their little hearts, and I'm, I'm just recently back from the States, 
The Americans allowed this to happen. But the Brits, after all, we have been sharpened up a bit by things like BSE. The Brits wouldn't allow people to introduce it. What we've got to have are similar safeguards for genetic modification as we have for drugs. You can't have tremendously strong safeguards for half the things that we introduce into the environment and none at all for the other half. Right, that's fair comment. Well, moving on, slight change of gear as we might what we saw at the beginning. Goat cheese tartlets with mint and raspberry and coconut cake. Cut, here she is. She's look, you're actually looking incredibly prepared to buy all of this. <laughs> Can that you pass around the forks, um, Paul and Danny, and we'll have a go on this. And then know, we can people also... always believe, watching at home, don't they, that these things are always faked up and they have them standing in the wings. You poor girl, I've never seen anybody <laughs> work so hard in a television studio. Hey, Brian, <laughs> thank you so much for letting everybody know that. Mm, hot. <laughs> it's hot. just come out of the oven. We are now going to have a look at uh, the wines because Danny suggested we're putting him on the line now. Let me just try this, um, the Beaujolais here. Gone very quiet, listeners. Oh, the Beaujolais, I have to say, is absolutely excellent, and I think it's going to be absolutely excellent with whatever gets dished up with it. Yeah. Brian, what did you think of the Shiraz? Shiraz is an interesting uh, wine. They're now producing it in Australia in very, very high tech modern methods. They, what about this particular this one? This is, haven't had a chance to cut it yet, viewers. That, that's nice. It's got sort of blackberry ish, really deep, nice, mellow, spicy overtone. It's a lovely wine. Lots of people find that, that ports are too heavy. And a nice wine like that. Do you want to try it with some raspberry um, cake? Mmm, the raspberries look fantastic. Isn't I think Brian could have a show all of his own, really, couldn't he? Yeah. Take the raspberry cake. <laughs> oh, yummy! Lovely cake. Lovely cake. That's Are you going to you taste it, one? Brian? Yes. Brian. How much does this stuff? He's <laughs> talking. Can he have a bother to taste it yet? What do you mm. reckon? Mmm, kinicky. That's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say <laughs> orgasmic on an afternoon program because it wouldn't be right. But that is a lovely, That's delicious, like that. gorgeous wine. Thank you for that, Brad. Danny, thank you for offering us those wines. They are clearly an absolute success. Thank you very much.